One of the things you learn in ministry is listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying in the service before you get up to preach. And it's always interesting how the Lord will confirm many times. Over and over again, I'm listening to the, the music tonight. One of my favorite choruses is there's coming a great awakening. And then listening to our sister testify right up here. And she's uh, talking about so many youth getting saved. I was a youth one time <laughs> several decades ago. Don't ask me how old, none of your business. But we're still on the firing line and still preaching and uh, doing uh, what we know to do. We follow the pattern out of Prescott. You folks are popular all over the world. They know who you are, especially on the island of Guam. Pastor Mitchell comes and preaches every February, does our healing crusade. And uh, Jesse Cluck, my son, he's in India. He said to me, Dad, have you ever invited Pastor Mitchell to a Bible conference? I said, I don't think I have. He said, why don't you invite him to come be our speaker? So I asked Pastor Mitchell, would you come? He said, am I invited? <laughs> so he's coming again twice in a year at 88 years of age and still preaching the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Joe Campbell told me a few weeks ago, he said, Pastor Mitchell has set the bar so high. How could we ever retire? <laughs> no, I just have a feeling that uh, should the Lord tarry, of course, I'm looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. But if it doesn't happen, amen, don't weep over me. Just put me in a tin can and bury me and sing the hallelujah chorus and thank God that I graduated. And don't bring me flowers then. Bring them to me now while I can smell them. I'm glad you're in church on a Sunday night. Book of Ezra, if you have your Bibles, Ezra chapter 3, just a few verses out of the book of Ezra. During the first great awakening uh, in the United States, Jonathan Edwards wrote that the revival has been chiefly amongst the young. In 1904, during the great Welsh revival, one witness reported that one of the most striking characteristics of the movement was its effect on young people and even on children. The youth of our congregations, they write, are nearly all the subjects of deep religious impression. Very young people, children from 10 to 14 years of age, gather together to hold prayer meetings and pray very fervently in many places, the young people hold a prayer meeting of their own, and these sometimes proved instrumental in bringing the powerful influences of, of the revival to that particular locality, the majority. Listen, the majority of all the converts of the revival were young people. I want to preach tonight on the coming awakening out of the book of Ezra chapter 3, beginning of verse number 10, if you have your Bibles, that's page 587. <laughs> when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel, and they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses Old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. I want you to notice verse number 13, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard afar off. 
I want to preach tonight a message I've titled, The Old Men Wept and the Young Men Shouted. Father, we thank you for the Holy Ghost. Tonight we have no confidence in our own abilities, our own flesh. We thank you for the anointing that's been generated during worship, during praise, and I'm asking God that you would add your ingredient, anoint these lips of clay. I have no confidence tonight. I'm asking God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would destroy every yoke of bondage. In Jesus' powerful name, and all of God's people said, amen and amen. I want to consider with you tonight, first of all, the coming worldwide youth awakening. Our text says that the old men wept. That means that the young men and the women and children were shouting. I believe tonight I have the conviction and I feel something very powerful has begun to move in the spirit realm in our country. I believe we're in for a great awakening. And it's hard to believe that recently we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Jesus movement. Amen. I was saved in the Jesus movement. I was saved as a direct result of the Asbury revival, the effect it had on the Methodist church. I was saved in a Methodist church in the charismatic wing of a Methodist church. And I have hope for the Methodists tonight because the Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first. I witnessed the change in our nation because the Holy Spirit fell on millions of young people. Anything that we did in those days worked. Amen. You could have shown a Godzilla movie. King Kong give an altar call and people have got, would have gotten saved. And one of the things that I've discovered, once you're an eyewitness of something, you're never the same again. Once you see something like that, you're ruined for anything else. And every revival without fail, as you read history, was first of all a youth movement. Someone said one time that revolution is a young man's game. The next one will be no exception. One writer said we need to turn our churches into a magnet for youth. And it's not only doable, it is now mandatory. We are seeing a phenomena in the islands. I'm preach every six months in the Philippines at least. And I'm telling you, when that plane banks over Manila Bay every time, it's always the evening time, and as far as the eye can see are lights, 20 million people strong. This past conference, the building was packed to capacity. They're sending out record numbers of churches, 410 churches, last count in seven different nations of the world. Filipinos preaching in Taiwan, Filipinos preaching in Abu Dhabi, some of them preaching in other Middle Eastern countries. I'm telling you, friend, 80% of the population of the Philippines is under the age of 30. Had the privilege of preaching with Pastor Payne last year, a year ago, just a year ago, April, we preached in China together. I'm looking over that crowd of about 500, and the majority of the, of the crowd there are young people under the age of 25. Revival's coming. And God's not going to leave America out. I thank God for a blood wash to Africa. I thank God that a new church is being planted somewhere on the countryside in the Philippines every three days. I thank God that Korea is being Christianized, but I'm here to tell you that God's not going to leave America out. We are seeing a phenomena at this time around the world. Catholics make good Christians. God has made me a promise, and I've come to preach this prophetic message I want to tell you by the Spirit of God tonight that we're going to see some marvelous marvelous things before we leave for heaven. And I can tell you after 43 years, almost 43 years of, of ministry, 48 years of salvation, I believe it's even closer tonight than you think. Most modern day surveys indicate that up to 85% of all people who get saved are converted before the age of 30. 
Most are saved before the age of 25. Sometimes old folks are like cement. They're all mixed up and well set. Joseph Chambers, the old classical Pentecostal, he's even more radical, hardcore. He said, by the 14th birthday, 90% of those who will serve the Lord have been decided. By the age of 21, 90%, 6% of those well, the, of the rest will spend eternity in hell fire. Now, I read that. I thought that's pretty wild. I'm not sure I totally agree with that, but those stats should make us weep. It's, it's not God's will. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. One preacher described young people as the kindling which helps set fire to old logs. I know I've got some snow on the roof, but I've still got some fire down in the boiler room tonight. I don't feel old. I feel quickened. A matter of fact, in the worship service tonight, Jet lag kicked in, but when the worship service began and people began to sing and praise God, the Holy Ghost began to move, and I feel quickened in my spirit tonight. And even as I'm preaching this tonight, every time I preach on revival, every time I preach on the rapture of the church, I feel a special anointing because right around the corner, one of these days, we're going to lose gravity and leave this world behind. Please feed my dog, would you? He's a Christian dog. (laughs) Here's the promise, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions also upon my uh, my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. In every generation, God has been faithful to bring a spiritual awakening to nations. In almost all cases, the movements of the spirit are most evident among young people. I'm telling you, the nations are waiting. I'll be in in, in India in uh, in July, and uh, where Jesse lives, just in the New Delhi area, there's 52 million people. Incredible opportunity for the gospel. Revolution almost always begins with young adults. You wonder why they draft 18-year-olds, because they don't have enough sense to be afraid. It's a weak mind and a strong back. That's the reason why they draft them. Young people are impulsive. On the other hand, very often they're ignorant to their own mortality. And I preached to that crowd yesterday uh, up on the reservation in that cemetery. I said, don't ever think for one moment that you're too young to die. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. Amen. And I've met lots of old folks. And how many know white hair is not always the sign of wisdom? I've met just about as many old fools as young fools. Anyway, that's not in the notes. I just threw that in there. But look at the Bible history. We have a case history. Joshua and the generation under 20. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 39, your little ones and your children who you say will be victims who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it and they shall possess it. Here's David, the young hero. 1 Samuel 17, 33, they said, you're, you're not able to do this. You're not able to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. I went to Israel several years ago, and I used to love these guides that we had, the bus drivers, their names, Amos, Moses, Elijah. I love that. And they took us down to the brook, where David found five smooth stones. And he explained to us, again, that Goliath had four brothers. He intended to kill them all. Who's first? The Bible said he ran toward Goliath. That's youth. Josiah, the boy king, who started a revival in 2 Chronicles 34, in the eighth year of his reign, There's Jeremiah, the young prophet. Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, shut up. That's the Glenn Cluck translation of 
Jeremiah chapter 1. John the Baptist and his radical message. Look at these New Testament revivals. John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt, and he ate locusts and wild honey. The original Jesus movement. Commentary say, now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. The disciples who followed Jesus probably ranged in age from 21 to 35, and many others followed him, including teenagers and children. From these young leaders, the Lord established a church that turned the world upside down. We can speak of John Calvin and more contemporary revivals in the 1500s. He was converted at age 25. There's Martin Luther, himself a young man. Luther was joined by a man by the name of Philip, 20-year-old scholar. Jonathan Edwards, a young preacher in Northampton, Massachusetts. We heard about him this morning through Pastor Mitchell's message. Edwards had a great influence on the youth of his day. In 1734, some exciting things began to happen among the young people of New England. There's Yale College in 1796. 26 Yale students founded an organization on campus called the Moral Society, which discouraged profanity, immorality, and drinking. Can you imagine they went on campus this today? We can speak in 1858 of Dwight L. Moody, who began an outreach to young people in Chicago, started a Sunday school. Don't tell me God can't move in our children's church. Sunday school for youth in a vacant tavern, which soon grew into a church filled with young believers. C.T. Studd, a convert of Moody. Moody's ministry at Cambridge University in England. Studd was was, uh, the toast of the nation, captain of their champion cricket team, top sportsman, an inheritor of a small fortune. He became a part of the Cambridge Seven and died on the mission field. We could talk about the Welsh revival. We could talk about the student volunteer movement of 1886. 1904, the 20th century outpouring of the Holy Spirit with Evan Roberts. The Azusa Street Revival of 1906. In 1905, nearly one-fourth of Yale College's students were part of a campus prayer meeting. A student voluntary movement began to rise up and great missionary movements in this century. You could talk about the 1948 Canadian Revival, the Latter Rain Movement. We spoke about Billy Graham this morning, one of the greatest worldwide evangelists of all time. His ministry became successful, and uh, his name began to become famous out of Los Angeles, California, in 1949 as one of the first speakers for a new movement with young people called Youth for Christ. Then the Jesus Movement. Saved in the Jesus Movement, I saw hippies delivered from drugs, 45-second cure from heroin addiction after prayer. Amen. Amen. You say, Pastor, did you come out of a dysfunctional family? The real question is, is there any functional family left? Alcoholic parents, drinking at teenager, 15 years of age, watched, walked into the church. If I would have died, they would have cremated me. I would have burned for four days. Walked into the church a drunk on an eight-lane highway to hell. And walked out delivered by the power of God and haven't touched another drop of alcohol since. Amen. (laughs) Buried my father-in-law yesterday, backslidden 18 years, saved in an Oral Roberts tent revival. 1976, my wife went on a 10-day fast, bound by alcoholism. And I invited him to a, a prayer breakfast, a men's breakfast. How many ever prayed for something to happen so long, and then when it happened, you freaked? I said, would you like to go? He said, yes. I said, hmm. He went to that prayer breakfast. When the altar call was given, I felt him lift up out of his seat and walk down the aisle. He got delivered in that service, delivered by the power of God, came back that afternoon, took my wife and all of her siblings out for lunch and the wife, and apologized That's what Jesus can do. We buried him yesterday. 
He's still reading his Bible, had a daily devotional with God, and still telling people about Jesus. And the testimonies that came out yesterday in that memorial service is a testimony of what God can do in a move of God. Let me tell you something tonight. God can clean out the intensive care unit of the hospital. God could resurrect him tonight and set him at our breakfast table tomorrow morning if he wants to. He can heal anything from a hangnail to AIDS. I don't care what the doctors have told you. I don't care if your back is up against the wall. You can't back up any further now. God is in this place to help you and set you free tonight. Revival is coming again, an awakening, I believe, without a shadow of doubt, to young people. I'll look secondly, and I'm going to move real quick here. Verse number 12 says, But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. I want to look secondly at a fresh challenge to the aging. Did you notice there, I'm being very nice, I didn't say you old people. Our text says the old men wept because they remembered. I want to tell you that memory is the gift of recall. And it's very clear in the Bible that God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. God said if you forget, you're unrighteous. And these men remembered what God did in the first temple. My memory is not that short. It's an absolute miracle what God has done out of Prescott, Arizona. You know, people fly here. We, we're, my wife and I were driving in from Phoenix again. She said, people think that they're coming to a Mecca. And they're looking as they're moving up through, you know, Mayor and the metropolis of Humboldt. <laughs> through Prescott Valley, Fane Road. And they're looking for the Mecca. They're wondering, where is this Mecca? When I landed in Prescott, 1975, it was actually Christmas of 74. I came to meet my in-laws for the first time. He came home drunk that night and threatened to kill everybody in the house. And he said, I'm going to kill that white boy too. And I I want to go to heaven, but I'm in no real hurry. (laughs) And, you know, the Mecca, Prescott, 15,000 at that time. I believe there was 15,500 people total in the city of Prescott. I went to Prescott Valley. There was a restaurant. I believe there was a little cafeteria, cafe, and a, and a gas station. That was all, and, a, and lots and lots of lots out there. Why didn't I purchase some lots? <laughs> but we didn't have any money then and not a lot of money now. 2020 hindsight. Could have bought a lot there for $5,500. Don't get bitter now. I'll pray for you at the end of this service. My question tonight is, are you satisfied or are you tired in your spirit? Something happens to us when we begin to age. And I believe that's a question of life and death. I'm not asking you tonight if life is being fair to you. You know, the wrong question to ask some folks is, how are you doing? Do you have an hour and a half for me to tell you how bad? You know, one pastor told me the other day, he said, we're getting so old. We used to ask, how are you doing? Now we ask, are you regular? (laughs) Now, I am unapologetically trying to ignite here a special fire in your soul. It's way, it's way more important, listen to me, way more important than your cholesterol, your blood sugar, or how your joints are doing. Psalms 91, verses 14 to 16, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, I will set him on high, because he's known my name, he shall call upon me, I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my... Have you ever read a scripture in one phrase? This one phrase jumped up and pimp slapped me. 
With long life, I will satisfy him. Not just existing, enduring to the end. This is a precious promise of living out your days until those days have satisfied your soul. Satisfied that you have accomplished your purpose in this planet. God gives us many promises. Psalms 92 verses 12 to 15. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. And I love this part, verse 14. They shall still bear fruit in old age. And on top of that, they shall be fresh and flourishing, not old and cranky. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. This is a promise. Dylan Thomas, he wrote a poem about his father. And the opening stanza is, don't. Do not go gentle into the good night, he wrote. Old age, he wrote, should burn and rage at the close of the day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light, he wrote. The reason why he wrote that is because his father had been robust, militant all of his life. And when in his 80s, he became blind and weak. His son was disturbed seeing his father become soft and gentle is what he wrote. In the poem, Thomas is rousing his father to continue being the fierce man that he had previously been. And I've come tonight on this Sunday night, and I'm just going to hit you and run because I get to fly away 6,000 miles. I'm going to head for the exits right after. I've come to rouse you this evening. Have you turned soft and gentle, slowly surrendering to your decline? Mario Murillo wrote, Maybe it's time for you to fold up your walker and use it to fight off your children (laughs) for trying to put you in a rest home. You already have a home. You need to shake the gravitational force of your feelings, symptoms, and the stupidity of our culture. Have you muffled dreams, purposes, and goals because your spirit is tired? I'm talking tonight about unfinished business. You have unfinished business for your children, your grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. You can't leave yet. King David experienced unfinished business. I love reading about King David. He grew old and cold. What is it about age? My wife and I were trying to take a nap this nap. Both of us, our feet are cold. In Prescott, my feet's cold. In the middle of the afternoon, what is this? I said, it's not old age. I bind that in the name of Jesus. I take dominion over that. Here is, here is David. He couldn't keep warm. He's bedridden by his own spirit. So how do you know that? I know this because of how he reacted to the latest news. 1 Kings 1.18, so now look, Adonijah has become king, and now my Lord the king, you do not know about it. Commentary said about Adonijah, this is great. He was the personification of abuse of wealth and power. He had the personality so shallow and so annoying that the idea of King Adonijah horrified David, and it also woke him up in his old age. Sometimes we need God just to wake us up. Solomon is supposed to be king. A generation is at stake. And the energy that David couldn't find is now back in his old age. He's out of bed into a chariot with his son Solomon, and it stirred him to action. 1 Kings 1 and verse 40, and all the people went up after him, and the people played the flutes and rejoiced with great joy. Sounds like a Pentecostal church service to me. So that the earth seemed to split with their sound. Why is it we're so afraid of volume today? 
old and quiet. Hallelujah. I love church. The rightful king made the people rejoice so loudly that it caused an earthquake. That's unbelievable. So you say, what's the lesson here? I'm getting to it. Hold your horses. The younger generation could not save themselves. They needed a David. Likewise, the older saints in the Prescott Church, the Guam Church, and our fellowship need to ignore the hollow boast of a young culture that lacks wisdom and substance. You have an urgent gift to leave before you leave. Psalm 71, 17, O God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Verse 18, now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Joshua chapter 14, verses 10 to 13, Joshua was stunned and didn't even know what to say to the 80-year-old Caleb. This is an amazing verse. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. He said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, 85 years old, Joshua is stunned. By Caleb's declaration. And I love this part. As yet, as yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. I like this. Shoot them all. Let God sort it out. I like that. Nuke them till their eyes glow and shoot them in the dark. I mean... Oh, the potter's house is so violent. (laughs) Yeah, we've come tonight with a gospel gun, and we're going to stick the barrel right up the devil's right nostril and start pulling the trigger. You have a wealth of experience, wisdom, and talent, and you need to find fresh ways to give it away. You know, the Bible says here he's going to keep us alive until you are satisfied. And the most powerful force for rejuvenation there is, is the pull of prophecy. I want you to notice this powerful prophecy. Pastor Mitchell said this morning, people have been praying that he lives to be 175. I prayed every day. Let me tell you what keeps him alive. The same thing that kept Simeon alive. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, Bible said that Simeon expected God to save Israel. He had lived and breathed the promises that God gave to him. And because, listen, it lengthened his life. You read it again for yourself. He knew he would not die, he could not die, until he had seen the Lord's Christ because the Holy Spirit had revealed it to him. And I read this passage It makes me want to shout and tell you that life just begins at 60. What has the Holy Spirit revealed to you about your children, your grandchildren, and our nation? I had a praying grandmother. I hated to go visit her, but you know how it is. When grandma would open the door, I just walked right past her and right to the refrigerator. But I had to sit and listen. While she preached the gospel. I hated that. I couldn't even enjoy my sin. And I hated those words when I walked out the door. I'm praying for you. But she lived to see the day. My dad was delivered from alcoholism. Three packs of cigarettes every day. He had three cartons left over. He gave them to my uncle so he could die of cancer. He cleaned out the liquor cabinet. Mother and dad both got filled with the Holy Ghost in the same weekend. That old lady knew how to pray. And I hated those words. I'm praying for you. She lived to see the day my dad was saved. I was saved, called to preach. 
and came to hear me preach. Preaching in Chen Li, Arizona. She's sitting on the third row, weeping the whole time I'm preaching. They're leaving. Cars backing out. They're going back to the Holy Land. Pastor Mitchell asked me one time, are you going to the Holy Land this year? I said, I've already been to Tulsa. <laughs> he wasn't amused. <laughs> They're backing out of the driveway to go home, and I felt moved on to go tell her goodbye. She rolled the window down. I said, Grandma, I'm going to see you again. That's the last time I saw her in this world. But one of these days soon, I'm going to see her again. Her prayers and works did follow after her. You can't leave yet. You've got kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, and God's going to put a hook in their jaw and drag them to the foot of the cross until they repent. I'm always amused at people standing up in testimony service. I found the Lord. He wasn't lost. You were. No, let's be honest. Most of us went kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. God put his foot right on my chest. I threw up the white flag and surrendered. I want to speak to the aging again here. Has the enemy been eating away at your promises and promises and mandate? You know, a broken heart will create a tired spirit and a weakened body. And God wants to bring a healing tonight. You're going to pray in every last member of your family. Wrap yourself back into the prophetic word. Wait on the Lord and you shall renew your strength and you will mount up with wings as eagles, with long life and years worth living, declaring to the heavens that I am satisfied. I want to close, and I'm going to close real quick. I don't want the tenth gift to operate, the gift of continuance. So what's next? That's the question. I believe, as Pastor Mitchell believes, that God Almighty intervened November 2016 and gave us a reprieve. Instantly after the election, the spiritual atmosphere began to change. There are encouraging signs of revival and moving of the Holy Spirit, and Christian leaders are sensing that another awakening among young people may just be around the corner. I believe something has happened. God said to me, cracking the code of the millennials is nothing with me. You know, I get tired of reading about, we're now in a post-Christian era. Well, if you want to live in a post-Christian era, that's your business. If you'd like to stay around through the tribulation, you can eat sea rations if you like. But I'm going to the marriage supper of the Lamb where I can eat all the frijoles and tortillas all I want without gaining an ounce. Ladies, be happy. No more Vidal Sassoon. No more Jenny Craig. No more Weight Watchers. Can you rejoice and shout praises to God tonight? No more tears. No more sorrow. It'll be safe for a woman to walk down the streets of that city. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be. Before we get out of here, we intend to give the devil more trouble than he bargained for. Here's a classic picture in this text of a move of God. The old men wept and the young men shouted. And together, I said together, they ushered in a mighty move of God. Revival is a combination of zeal and fervor and vim and the vigor of youth and the steady wisdom of the older, mature saints. Some people are not older and mature. That's embalming fluid. But we need the backbone of the older, and we need the radical energy of the young. I had a preacher preach for me a while back, and it was masterful. He was a great preacher. He preached a whole sermon on wineskins. It's every pastor's dream. He's saying things that I cannot say. I mean, there was blood everywhere. There's, he's, he's lacerating. It's, it's lovely. It's wonderful. I'm back there. I'm trying not to shout, but <laughs> praise God. And uh, it was a classic on old wineskins. 
And he preached a message. It was a classic. Old wineskins who become brittle, inflexible, set in their ways. It was wonderful. It was great preaching. Great altar service. But the Bible does say that in Bible days they would take these older wineskins and dip them in water to make them flexible and usable again. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. Don't quit. Just go for another dip. That's what some of us need to do tonight is we need to go for another dip and get get refilled with the Holy Spirit again. There's one baptism but many infillings of the Holy Spirit. Could we bow our heads together? Thank you for your patience. Holy Spirit is moving upon hearts tonight. You're a visitor, young or old, middle-aged, man, woman, boy or girl, under the sound of my voice. You don't even know what's exactly what you're feeling right now, but that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God is faithful. God is dealing with you tonight in this service. You say, Pastor, I don't Know that I've ever in my lifetime ever experienced what it is to have my sins forgiven. Tonight you're burdened with sin. My memory's not that short. I I remember the burden, the paranoia of addiction. The paranoia that came with addiction. The paranoia of life. The Bible said the wicked flee when no man is pursuing. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. You're here tonight, you're desperate before God. You say, Pastor, I don't understand half the things that you said, but I do know this one thing. My heart is not right with God. I'm unsaved. I'm backslidden. I'm away from God. Would you pray for me? Remember me in your prayer. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird, strange, but you'll just simply be honest. Lift up your hand right where you're seated. Hold it up for just a moment. You know you're not right with God, but you want to get right with God before you leave this service tonight. Lift it right up, front to back, side to side, man, woman, boy or girl. There are people here. Don't be ashamed. This is your night for a miracle. God has a miracle with your name on it. And this is where it all begins, right here. If God can set things right in your heart, He can set things right in every area of your life. Pastor, pray for me. Anyone at all, young person, older person. I got saved as a young teenager, but I had had experienced sin, lived in sin. The horrible torture, the wages of sin is death. Dying on the inside. Depressed, suicidal. No purpose. But Jesus came. My whole life changed. I didn't get religious I didn't sign my name to some kind of a creed, join a church. I was born again. Joining a church is important. But signing your name on a roll and shaking hands with a pastor doesn't mean that you're saved. You're not right with God, but you lift that hand up. Here's my hand, Pastor. Would you pray for me? I need God tonight. I want to give a challenge then. Young people, we need your energy. This is not the time to backslide. This is the time to catch on fire so that the world can watch us burn. Older people here tonight, can I give a fresh challenge to the aging? You can't leave yet. You've got children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren who desperately, desperately need God. You're the lifeline. Your prayers mean something to God. We're going to stand our feet. We're going to open this altar. God is dealing with your heart tonight. You say, what's next? Let me tell you what's next. A devil chasing, sin killing, Holy Ghost, tongue talking revival is going to come to this nation again. And it's going to be no different than before. The youth of this nation are targeted by the Holy Spirit. This altar is open as we stand our feet, as we sing this chorus and worship to the